Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to Imperial Armor, where today we're going to look at a super, super heavy tank, the Capital Imperialis. A 50 meters tall and 80 meters long vehicle with a spaceship's cannon for a main gun. We will also have a quick look at some of the what I will call the different designs of the capital as well, such as the Leviathan, the Colossus, and the Cyclops. And on that note, we will also have to address the elephant in the room, or in this case, the dwarf elephant, the squat elephant, if you will. But first, it is your boy Raid Shadow Legends. The uh, tip-top AAA quality dungeon delving strategy game available for both PC and mobile devices. With over 600 champions to use for dungeons, raid bosses, PvP and a campaign mode. Plus, the main topic for today's shoutout, the Doom Tower. One of raids ultimate challenges. This titanic tower is the final prison for several evil entities shackled to its interior thousands of years ago by the Arbiter. But with the slow creeping return of Siroth, the bonds are growing weaker day by day. And so it is up to you and your team of crack champions to fight through all 120 floors to the ultimate boss room at the top. Combating not only hordes of tough-as-nails regular enemies, but mini-bosses every ten floors. Though there really is nothing mini about them, and many require unique skills and tactics to deal with effectively. And this is of course also the challenge that I enjoy, as I make my way up the Doom Tower with each rotation, bringing fresh bosses, enemy challengers, and huge rewards. In the raid news for this month, we have the DK Rises promo code, which is still live and chock full of extra goodies to level up the Death Knight, which you may have picked up from a recent event or any other great character of your choice. We also have the Halloween update, where US raid players can enter to win amazing gifts like a $1,000 Amazon gift card and several of Raid's best Halloween-themed champions. Do check the bottom part of the video description box for full details and disclaimer on how to join. So, sign up today! And, as always, new players will, by using the QR code on screen or clicking the link in the description below, get the free champion Virgies along with almost $30 worth of starter pack value and this in-game loot. You will find all of these rewards here in your inbox. And now, on with the lore. Let us begin with aforementioned squat little mammoth. Back in the day, when the capital Imperialis was a real thing on the tabletop, the Squats were a real thing as well, and they had a whole battery of capital Imperialis-like looking things. The Cyclops, the Colossus, the Leviathan, and even of course the Land Train. <laughs> I do miss the land train. It was a brilliant and rather unique little unit. I really, really like it, but let's not get too lost in reminiscence, shall we? But the capital Imperialis was specifically the Imperial capital Imperialis, whereas the Squats equivalent was the Leviathan. Now, the two immediately look somewhat similar, and the Leviathan is a thing in modern day 40k fluff as well. In fact, it is specifically mentioned that it was created for the Imperium by the Squats. So in other words, the Squats drew up the schematics and then went, hey Imperial dudes, have this ginormous thing with a bay honking old cannon. And so the Leviathan right now is an Imperial vehicle. Basically, the divide appears to be that the Squats had super heavies, and the Imperium needed a super heavy as well. So Leviathan, Cyclops, and Colossus 
are squats, capitals, whereas the capital imperialis is the purely imperial one. This of course would be a pointless distinction to make seeing as the squats were all eaten by the Tyranids. Up until recently that is, with the reintroduction of the squats via the Leagues of Wotan. Now one could have a bit of an argument as to whether or not the Leagues of Wotan are really the squats, I'll probably fall on the no side of that argument, but they are Games Workshop's designated successors, shall we say, and so a little bit of bookkeeping is necessary. I'm not going to turn this into a squats discussion lore video, although I might have to make one of those because there are certain elements of squats lore I really really hate. Not to mention, they were blatantly broken on launch as well, to the point that practically every single competitive tournament around the world banned the squats the moment they laid their eyes on the book. <laughs> Which is uh, an achievement. You'd think that after some three decades of writing rules, GW would have developed some kind of skill or expertise, but uh, you would be wrong. So, the key distinction here to make is that if, say, the Cyclops was to be reintroduced, it would probably be a different vehicle entirely, as it would be a you know, League of Wotan vehicle, and the Cyclops is a very, very old design. Thus, we are going to treat the Colossus, the Cyclops, the Leviathan, and the Capital Imperialis as different from these theoretical leagues of Wotan's vehicles if they will ever appear. This also means that since all of them look very similar and are clearly based on the same chassis, I am going to make the reasonable leap of logic that the Capital Imperialis and all the others are essentially based on the same tank chassis, making them variants on the same generalistic STC with different loadouts and purposes and etc, which is why we're going to be covering all of them. With the bookkeeping out of the way, what exactly is a capital imperialis and why is it such a big deal? Well, as we said initially, it is ridiculously heavily armed. A macro cannon, or as it is called on the capital imperialis, the behemoth cannon. This is normally a weapon mounted on literal spaceships. And to hammer home the point, the capital imperialis is also equipped with a void shield, <laughs> making it, even by 40k standards, reasonable to refer to the capital as a land ship. <laughs> I just... Oh god, I, I do love a bit of this old design aesthetic. It is just a big, beautiful, bountiful brick with a hilariously enormous gun mounted on top of it. <laughs> it. It doesn't look practical. It doesn't even look particularly dangerous, really. I mean, it has dick all close in defense. Like six sponsons, which can't even all fire and certainly can't fire in front of it. Not to mention those ridiculous little tracks, which would undoubtedly bury the entire thing a hundred meters into the ground in five seconds, just due to the weight. <laughs> and yet, and yet I still adore this kind of old styly design. But the Capital Imperialis' main job is not actually to fight anything, despite the rather ludicrous main armament. Instead, its primary purpose is to serve as an enormous command and control centre for Imperial officers that are very, very far up on the ladder. You need to be somebody uh, quite special to warrant a capital imperialis as a personal headquarters. We're talking the kind of people who command entire battle fronts during a major imperial crusade here, where only the finest of protection is ever enough. And the capital most certainly provides it, as not only is its void shield of course a tremendously potent defensive weapon, there are accounts in the fluff of the capital taking hits by titan killer weaponry whilst its shields is down and barely noticing, because it literally has a dozen meters of armor on the front. 
again. It should sink into the ground due to the sheer weight, but it doesn't because of magic. And you know what? It might actually be because of magic, because remember, the Titans, they don't work either, but they work because of the, the engine and the various magical mechanicas doodars inside of it. So, cause magic might actually be a relevant explanation here. And the capital does need this absurd level of defense because, well, here's the thing. A Warhound Titan has a Void Shield Generator as well, and yet its primary defense against the kind of weaponry that could potentially pop Void Shields is its relative speed and maneuverability rather than the Void Shields. And the capital is, um... <laughs> Not the definition of nippy. It can at absolute best move at a brisk walking pace. It is also redunculously large and exceedingly difficult to miss with even orcish weaponry, meaning that it uh, really does need to be able to take a hit or two. Though if the capital Imperialis is under attack, something will probably have gone very, very, very wrong. As although more adventurous commanders might use it as a frontline bastion, it really is intended to be chilling further back behind the lines and acting again as a command and control center, where its over-the-top defense and armaments are a last-ditch defensive measure against surprise enemy attacks or breakthroughs of the front line rather than an actual battlefield asset. To help in this task, the capital is also equipped with an enormous quantity of communications equipment, and various strategic overlays like a massive hololithic table, and tons and tons and tons of dedicated vox links, through which orders can be sent out to every commander on the planet rapidly and without a time loss. Furthermore, the hololithic display is also linked directly to either the commander's or ships in orbit. Actually, why am I saying or? Or both, even better. Allowing for continuous, real-time strategic and tactical updates to be fed directly to the commander, allowing him to, if he so chooses, zoom in on a single bunker or zoom out to see the flow and ebb of the entire front line. This, obviously, is an inc incredibly powerful tool for a commander. And with all of the communications capabilities, it also allows him to send out pinpoint orders, even down to the individual squad level if he so chooses, or give instructions to the entire warfront at once. This is the true value of the Capital Imperialis. It allows the commander to be on the field, receiving the most immediate and up-to-date reports continuously, and keep him safe at the same time. As normally, these commanders would be high up in orbit, or preferably on an entirely different planet, introducing a great deal of communications lag. And these precautions would be taken for the simple reason that if the bastard decided to up and die somehow, it might very well paralyze an entire sector. <laughs> You can't risk losing commanders of this level and seniority. Hell, we're not even just talking about the immediate inconvenience of losing one's top level command. The loss of a commander on this level in an ongoing crusade is likely to actually cause a full-scale civil war within the ranks of the Imperial Guard as his 200 lesser officers all compete for his seat. A scenario to be avoided at every cost. And so, whilst the capital Imperialis absolutely can be used as an assault transport, capable of carrying hundreds of troops with armoured vehicles to the front line, it's probably not a very good idea. Only to be done in pressing times. Besides, if you have a position you want assaulted, 
there are bigger things to throw at it, as is always the case in the 41st millennium, as the capital Imperialis is far from the biggest fish in the pond. Oh no, the appropriately named Leviathan is nearly twice the size of the capital Imperialis at 90 meters. To put that kind of size into a bit of perspective, the highly theoretical World War II German design for the P-1000 Ratter was only 11 meters. <laughs> Again, the uh, Leviathan is not what I would call a practical design, but it certainly is um, <laughs> very 40k. And, thusly, of course, everything is better the bigger it is. The Leviathan's offensive firepower, of course, boasts the same centrally mounted macro cannon as the capital Imperialis, but it also has 12 Lehman Russ battle cannons, used essentially as sponsons on this goddamn thing, along with two dozen batteries of heavy bolters. And of course, similarly, its defensive capabilities have also been upgraded, whereas the poor, small and soft capital Imperialis must make do with but a single void shield generator, this, insults to the laws of gravity and physics, has four of them. Why? <laughs> when would this possibly be needed, you may ask? Well. Somebody might decide to kamikaze a spaceship into it. Hey, it's a theoretical possibility. You've got to make sure it's capable of standing up to the most ardent challenges of the modern day battlefield environment. <laughs> this thing is a joke. And a pretty good one too, if I'm to be entirely honest. It also obviously has an even better suite of command, control, and logistical systems than the capital Imperialis does. In fact, this thing can play host to several officers of equivalent classes commanding several war fronts over ridiculous distances. It even has the capabilities to launch and recover Aquila landers and Valkyries. Yeah, for added convenience, so the command staff can bring in their favorite officers' mattresses, obviously. And equally self-evidently, if the capital Imperialis is designed for a commander that handles a planet, this thing is designed for a commander that handles a planet currently being invaded by a Black Crusade. The sheer over-the-top nature of this thing is just absolutely adorable. And it very much so fits the scale of warfare that people often believe that 40k has. See, this is one of the common misconceptions about 40k. They were like, oh, armies of millions of men, la 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 la. Actually, armies of millions of men aren't really that impressive. Already back in World War II, Germany invaded the Soviet Union with some four and a half million men. The Soviet Union would mobilize well over 30 million men in its defense. We've already reached that level of warfare, and more often than not, due to the logistical incompetencies of GW writers, you've got stuff like the Siege of Rax, where they've only got a, a couple hundred thousand dudes, tops, numbering by the regiments, and yet they're attacking in waves numbering in the millions. Mm. Sigh. The GW writing staff really could do with a basic military tutorial at some point, but oh well, details. And before we waffle too far off the point, if the Leviathan is the biggest boy currently, what could possibly be worse than the Leviathan? Why is the Leviathan a mere command vehicle? Well, it's because back in the day, we also had stuff like the Colossus. Oh yes, you see those two cannons? Yes, the uh, the Leviathan only has one of those. This thing has two, because obviously, 
twice the Makoto Cannon firepower is twice as good. And hey, you know what? They're right. In addition to it, it also has four plasma missiles, eight battle cannons, and 16 heavy bolter batteries. You know, in case some of that pesky infantry somehow decides to get too close to this thing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think desertion the better option than charging straight forward at a tank that's scraping the atmosphere. But that isn't even the best part. Oh no, oh no 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 no, because surely this must be some kind of ridiculous line breaker vehicle, right? This must be a doomsday weapon deployed in only the most horrific of conflicts. This must be the kind of shit that the SWATs broke out when they needed to fight off entire orc wargs and they could only bring a single vehicle because of reasons, right? No 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 no, this is a scout vehicle. And <laughs> ironically, not in the uh, usual military sense, but the Colossus is not actually a tank per se, in fact. It is instead a mobile mining station. Now, first and foremost, I would like to raise some questions as to the mobility of any of these vehicles, frankly. As one, their speed is disappointing at best, and two, how do you think these things handle terrain? <laughs> well, by crushing it, I would imagine. But uh, I imagine a gentle slope would be um, problematic, or at the very least, reduce the speed to the rate of a snail's pace. But no, 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 this is a mobile mining installation that is also designed to defend itself against uh, Abaddon when he comes knocking occasionally. <laughs> What? What the hell? What kind of mining rights were the squats eyeing that required this thing? I am genuinely curious. Ay ay ay. Actually, 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 there is an answer to that question. And the answer is other squats. <laughs> That's the best part. So the, the, the final war machine, the Cyclops here, was invented by an appropriately named person, Hakrund the Insane, who had a brilliant idea. You see, his league, the League of Grindel, his family, his extended clan, etc., were in a dispute over mining rights with the League of Thor. And the League of Thor, unfortunately, was far larger and possessed a much larger number of Colossuses and Leviathans. And since what dick measuring contests were usually decided by the number of colossi on either side, the war seemed a foregone conclusion until aforementioned brilliant individual Hakrund the Insane had a eureka moment. If the enemy is in possession of more big toys than I am, then all I need do is destroy their toys with a very large gun. And so the Cyclops was born, which simply mounted an even larger ship's cannon. Well, I mean, you can't fault their logic, really. The previous ship's gun worked just fine, so surely doubling its size is not going to introduce any complications. <laughs> and it didn't. It was, it was just fine. Oh, sweet baby Jesus. Old 40k lore is, um, is a trip, to be sure. This cannon was dubbed the Hell Fury Cannon. Because of course it was. And in the very first battle of the very first Cyclops, it annihilated a Colossus and a Leviathan immediately. Which I imagine both shocked and surprised the poor bastards aboard them, because normally you don't just destroy these things in one hit, except once more, our genius inventor Hakrund the Insane had realized another thing as well. Not only was he going to mount a bigger gun on his ship, oh no no no, because you see, well, 
In terms of space combat, there are classes of weaponry like in everything else. If a macro cannon is the spaceship equivalent of a handgun, then a lance battery <laughs> must surely be the equivalent of a rifle. Yes, the, the healthier a cannon is a lance weapon capable of continuous fire to overload repeated enemy void shields and still impact on the armor behind it all and keep firing until the target is nothing more than molten slag. Barbaric though it might be, all is fair in love and war and all of that, and the Lee of Thor agreed, which is why they blatantly ripped off the design. <laughs> and started using it against its inventor. In fact, they started making so many cyclopses that entire squat halls were raised to the ground by both sides. Which, god, what a ridiculously apocalyptic war this must have been. Entire civilizations wiped out by little stunties going crazy over their weapons designs. And all of this for exploration rights. You see, somebody had found a, a famous lost stronghold and both leagues were clamoring to explore it first. It apparently never occurred to them to do it together. <laughs> ah, Christ, I do love the old law sometimes. Fortunately, the orcs appeared before the squats could wipe each other out and presented them with a target for their combined firepower and fury. Which I imagine made them very sad. And then the Tyranid came and ate everyone. The end. <laughs> How the hell the Tyranids ate a race that make massive rolling war machines as scout vehicles I do not know. But it did most assuredly happen. Oh, did it? Well, that's the Lord of Conflict of the League of Wotan popping up again, I do suppose. But I will wrap it up there. Until next time, I have been Arch, and I hope you now have a better understanding of just how utterly ludicrous old school Lord actually was. Have a good day.